When we remember a time, we remember moments. A kaleidoscope of the sights, the sounds, the emotions that remind us of the way we were. Our world. It's about time. Tonight, Between the Lines, in the summer of 1972. Here are Linda Ellerby and Ray Gandolf. For the next hour, think of your television set as a time machine. Tonight, we go to a time when the young are trying to tell us something, if only they and we knew what it is. Welcome to our world, unbutton something. It's summer, 1972. Think of that summer as a novel, a mystery maybe. So who done it? Well, you'll have to read between the lines for the answer, but after all, that's where some of the best stuff gets written. For a clue, look for words starting with the letter M, like McGovern, Millhouse, Miz, Miami, Mash, Munich, and Mick. Did you know that there was something of a religious explosion amongst the young in the summer of 72? I didn't. Maybe you had to be there. Well, we're going to take you there, but first we're going on a tour with some aging youngsters who had been making a joyful noise or some kind of noise for a long time. That summer, they got a new opening act. For eight weeks in 30 cities at 50 concerts, before a total of 750,000 people, five Englishmen set out to prove that after 10 years, the Rolling Stones were still the best rock and roll band in the world. The summers of love, the summers of uh, peace, flowers, understanding. Uh, there was a, a great sentiment of that in the concert. You could feel that just from the people around you. The warm-up act was a 22-year-old Motown graduate who was only beginning to hit his stride musically, Stevie Wonder. Ten years before, he'd begun as little Stevie Wonder. But everyone who heard him knew that there was nothing small about his talent or his future. That's why I'll always Stevie Wonder's publicist was Ira Tucker. It was definitely the first time uh, black artists had been exposed to that vast uh, of an audience. It was thousands upon thousands of people. New fans were nice, but having already sold 30 million records on his own when it came to fans, Stevie Wonder was not among the needy. There was so much excitement created around the Stones and Stevie being there together. Stevie had something that everybody liked. Even the people who uh, weren't really familiar with Stevie uh, liked the music. The Stones' image was that of, of uh, you know, being real wild and having a great time all of the time. And it was a good match because it kind of took the edge a little bit off of uh, the Stones' image. At the same time thousands of young people were insisting rock and roll was the reality, others saw it as so much dream soup. They were the ones rolling, not rocking, into Dallas that summer, and they had no sympathy for the devil. They called it Explo 72, a spiritual explosion. Today what is needed among American young people is the Christian mind, the mind of Christ. The Reverend Billy Graham, a warm-up act only for the Lord. The uh, Rolling Stones had larger audiences. Uh, uh, they had louder audiences. And uh, they had um, drugs and things like that that uh, you never found in any of these meetings. One way. Explo 72 uh, brought uh, together thousands of young people from all over the United States. It was a tremendous sort of a Christian Woodstock. This caught the imagination of some of the press people that where did all these clean young people come from? It was a, a tremendous uh, success to call attention to the fact that millions of young people were searching for a purpose and meaning to their lives. On June 17th, five middle-aged men were searching for documents, not a meaning to their lives, 
when they broke into Democratic National Headquarters in Washington. One o'clock that particular night, I discovered that a door had been taped. Watergate security guard, Frank Wills. I removed that particular tape from the door and made uh, a call to Metropolitan Police Department that uh, someone possibly had broken into the office building complex. I was in the uh, listening post, which was in the hotel adjacent to the Watergate office building complex where the Democratic National Committee was housed. E. Howard Hunt organized the break-in at the Watergate building. Well, I think it was about 1 o'clock in the morning or thereabouts when we could see lights flashing crazily around and we heard one of the people saying something about uh, some crazy characters up here they're wearing cowboy hats and boots and they've got guns the crazy guys in the cowboy hats and boots turned out to be a group of detectives or policemen from the district of columbia police we discovered that there were some men in the building in the democrat national committee headquarters with gloves and other electronic equipment they were arrested carried down to Metropolitan Police Department, and that was the beginning of that particular incident. The break-in looked like a local story, so the Washington Post assigned two local reporters, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein. That Saturday, there was a, a story on the front page of the Washington Post that uh, had a lot of information developed by Bob at the courthouse, a lot of information uh, developed by me through using the telephones, particularly calling down to to Miami, which is where some of the burglars were from, and I was able to establish some of their CIA connections. Woodward talked to Howard Hunt. Because Howard Hunt's name was in a phone book uh, carried by, by one of the burglars, along with the abbreviation W House, which meant it could be one of two things, a White House or a War House. Uh, I didn't much care about it becoming public or not, because I didn't think really we'd done anything wrong. I'd spent most of my adult life abroad uh, doing these, this very sort of thing for our government, and change of jurisdiction uh, really hadn't registered with me. Hunt, who had spent more than 20 years in the CIA, had been serving as a special consultant to the White House. One of the burglars, James McCord, was also a former CIA man, and at the time of the break-in was head of security for the committee to re-elect the president. G. Gordon Liddy was another member of the committee to re-elect, he and McCord were fired for not answering questions about the break-in. Mr. Liddy told me that the instructions to enter the Democratic National Committee headquarters had come from Mr. John Mitchell, who had recently been Attorney General. He was the one who granted monies to Liddy for a series of proposals to uh, do damage to the Democratic uh, Party's uh, prospects in the fall. And I felt that the president knew about it. I didn't know how we could engage in this sort of thing without presidential knowledge. On July 1st, former Attorney General Mitchell resigned as head of President Nixon's re-election campaign and addressed the Watergate break-in. Neither the president, obviously, or anybody in the White House or anybody in authority and any of the committees working for the re-election of the president have any responsibility for it, and therefore there's no reason why it should be a matter of concern to the American public, and it certainly won't hurt the president's re-election. Because Woodward and I were both local reporters, we didn't know anything about the White House and about the structure of the White House staff. So one of the first things we had to do was find out how it worked. So we got ourselves a list uh, of everybody who worked at the White House and everybody who worked at the Committee for the re-election of the president. We started finding out, yes, people were trying to cover things up. Yes, there were people who were connected to the White House and the President's re-election committee that had something to do with this break-in. They were frightened. They were intimidated. Some of them were shaking. Some, some people started to cry when we would, would start to talk about what had, what had happened. And that, that was the real giveaway, that, that there was something being hidden here that was quite awful. The position of the White House staff, and certainly that of the uh, Republican National Committee, was to disavow everybody, except that the problem was that we weren't disavowable. Several of the men indicted this afternoon have close ties to the White House or President Nixon's re-election campaign. According to investigators, James McCord, once chief security man for the Republicans, actually bought the bug and ran the spy squad. G. Gordon Liddy, a former White House aide and political money expert, gave McCord at least some of the money to finance the operation. McCord, Liddy, and E. Howard Hunt, another former White House consultant, intercepted many of the Democrats' conversations over a three-week period. 
Well, after the break-in, after the arrest of the five-man entry team, the activities of the White House Plumbers Unit, uh, the Special Investigations Unit, effectively came to an end. Everybody was running for cover and uh, making special arrangements to save their own skins. There's always something of the chess match and how politics is played, except that in real chess, all the moves are out in the open. And the real chess match that summer took place when an American upstart named Bobby Fischer put his pieces where his mouth was and took the world title from Boris Spassky and ended Soviet domination in chess. Come back for the next moves in the other game, politics. Our world will be right back between the lines in the summer of 72. One reason Buick Century is among the best-selling cars in America is that after it gets 113 inspections at the factory and 87 more at the dealership, it is then subjected to the ultimate inspection, yours. We check the workmanship of every century so thoroughly because it's a car so many people depend on. Buick, where better really matters. Sir, would you choose hamburger A, a Wendy's hamburger with fresh toppings, or hamburger B, which uses things like reconstituted onions? I'd pick B because it's got reconstituted onions. I'm working on tomatoes myself. Got them shrunk down to the size of a garden pea. I got three or four hundred of them right here in my pocket. Wouldn't you choose the fresh hamburger? Choose Wendy's. Look, Da Vinci, you've got great ideas, but I mean, what is this, an egg beater? It's a machine that will make man fly. Well, it'll never fly if you can't get your idea across. Here, use the Xerox desktop publisher. The workstation lets you create your documents, then the laser printer prints it out laser perfect. Looks neat, huh? And it'll fly. <laughs> desktop publishing from Team Xerox. It brings out the genius in you. Do you believe it? My gums are receding. You know, you can get cavities where you never knew you had teeth at the roots. I am going to use Listerment, because the fluoride in Listerment can penetrate the roots and help protect them. All this and fresh breath, too. Introducing new, improved, professional strength effort and denture cleanser. Stronger than ever. Removes more stains, more plaque, and kills germs. For a professional looking clean, get new, improved, professional strength effortant. Tired of all that other garbage on TV? Don't get mad. Cool off with Sledgehammer Friday. On the Disney Sunday movie, they're on the loose, <gasps> and they have a mission. To alleviate boredom, no matter what the consequences. Rat Patrol, Sunday. Welcome back to the summer of 1972. Even between the lines, our kids are sending us mixed signals. Take the two political conventions in Miami Beach. At the Democratic National Convention, the young helped George McGovern roll to a first ballot nomination. But the convention is a fiasco. At the orderly coronation of Richard Nixon, many of the young are outside the convention hall looking in, angry and discontented. But many others are working for the president and will vote for him that fall, the first time that 18-year-olds could vote for president. I wonder what it was like to be 18 that summer and listening to that song in Vietnam. We'd lost 46,000 Americans, despite 155,000 tons of bombs we'd dropped on North Vietnam. Now the president says we're mining the harbor. The war, unlike school, remains in session for summer. Meanwhile, in Miami, both parties convened at different times and each nominated a different view of the war. I say it shall be peace with honor and not peace with surrender for the United States of America. But there is no honor in four more years of bombing innocent children across the face of Indochina. Lives were at stake, Vietnamese lives and American lives, and we had an obligation to fight every single day with everything we had in us to stop that war. 
the Vietnam veterans against the war. They came to Miami to make a point. They were hard to ignore. That's Ron Kovic. He was impossible to ignore and meant to be. I think this was probably uh, the first time in American history where so many young men who had come back from a war were uh, literally marching across the country to protest the administration's policy in that war. Sunshine, go away today. I don't feel much like dancing. This old world, she's gonna turn around. They called themselves the last patrol, and they crossed a country hoping to change a country. We had a purpose, we had a direction. Uh, we had been used in that war, and that's why we went to Miami in 1972. Well, uh, I've been spending a lot of time hanging around down the beach. Not everybody for McGovern was scraggly looking, but almost no one for Nixon was, and they too made their point in Miami. Summer lovin' had me a blast. Summer lovin' happened so fast. Most of the young people think Nixon's great. Met a boy, cute as can be. We need this man. Well, oh, well, oh, well, oh, ooh. tell me more, tell me more. Did I think he's the best man. He's the incumbent president. He should be renominated. Tell me more, tell me more. Well, I agree with his policy. I think policies. I think he's doing the right thing in Vietnam. Uh -huh. Do -do. Uh -huh. Do -do. Uh -huh. It is my great honor to nominate Richard Nixon for re-election as the next president of the United States. The crowds cheered. The balloons went up. The incumbent smiled. And? Tonight, I again proudly accept your nomination for President of the United States. Just as the President began to speak, we began to shout, stop the bombing, stop the war, stop the bombing, stop the war. I was, I was afraid. I didn't know what was going to happen. Stop the bombing! Stop the bombing! Stop the bombing! Stop the bombing! Killing women and children! Do you hear me, people? Nixon did not hear Kovic because what Kovic was saying was not what Nixon wanted to hear. But those who were against the war would find someone else to listen, Senator George McGovern from South Dakota. They were people who believed deeply about the problems before the country, and they wanted somewhere to go where they could find a focus. They came into the 72 presidential campaign. And although so many of those who enlisted in McGovern's army to fight for peace were young, to call it a children's crusade would be unfair, but not entirely a lie. What do you think that uh, Senator McGovern could do for the country that President Nixon couldn't do? I mean, how about uh, the military policy? That I do like. That's one of the reasons I'm um, um, voting for McGovern. If I could, that would be one of the reasons I'm voting for McGovern and contributing money. Daniel Cross lived two doors away from McGovern. I won't want to... Uh blame the era, but I'm more on the conservative side of the fence than uh, the tape probably indicates I was then. His um, tax policy, I don't like, but I think it, um, it may be better than Nixon's. My mother's going for Nixon due to not liking McGovern's tax policy. I do remember that little fellow standing out there with his uh, lemonade stand. That was one of the uh, characteristics of that campaign. That's a self-starter. And then there was the Democratic Convention. Will the 36th annual convention of the Democratic Party please come to order? It was a new party, they said, and they were right. And the bright young men who got their man the nomination could not get their fellow Democrats to come to order. For Gary Hart, McGovern's campaign manager, it would be a learning experience. Frank Mankiewicz, campaign director, was a convention veteran, but this one was like none he'd ever seen before. No, it's been due to George McGovern. There were a lot of people there who'd never been to a convention before, uh, so that uh, the behavior of the delegates was not uh, traditional in political terms. I can see clearly the reason all those new people were there was that the Democrats had democratically decided the delegates must reflect the makeup of the party itself. This did not please the old guard, and that did not matter to the new Democrats. Shirley Chisholm, the first black woman to be nominated to be the presidential nominee. To take our rightful position in this country, and our rightful position means 50% of every elected and appointed body that exists. I was 24 years old. I was selected as a delegate. It was an opportunity to really feel in the center of things. 
Ken Elfstein, a delegate from New York, at the center of a thing. It's a very exciting week. Uh, in, in one week, I was appeared on, on newsstands throughout the world. The week before I was on the cover of Time, Johnny Bench was on the cover of Time. Senator George H. McGovern, having received a majority vote of this convention certified... July 12th, the grassroots had dug in. McGovern had won the nomination, only to be reminded that after win comes place, also known as the vice president. What we discovered is that there are a lot of people that don't want to be vice president. I was turned down in Miami by half a dozen people before we finally agreed on uh, Senator Eagleton. I was not his first choice. I knew that. The uh, radio and television were throwing out names all day long. His was Thomas Eagleton, a senator from Missouri. And, you know, as my name would be mentioned uh, on the radio and television, they'd give a little cheer. Great. Eagleton was up, Eagleton was down, Eagleton was in, Eagleton was out. July 14th, Eagleton was in, but the new Democrats were so overcome by democracy they forgot about TV and the advantages of a candidate making his acceptance speech while viewers are still awake. The old Democrats were happy to let the new Democrats learn the hard way. Well, the only place in the world where we ran in prime time was Guam. We did very well out in Guam, but unfortunately the great mass of the American people never saw that speech. It's too bad because the next thing they saw was the uh, nominee, George McGovern, struggling with what to do with the vice presidential nominee who turned out to be a person with a history of mental illness. That was July 25th, and for the next six days, the issue of Eagleton's mental health became the only issue. I charge no one with malice insofar as spreading these rumors are concerned. But it was at that time that, that I said, George, we ought to have a press conference, and I'll explain to the press what the situation is, answer any questions they have in a um, naive way, I said, and we'll be done with it. On three occasions in my life, I have voluntarily gone into hospital as a result of nervous exhaustion and fatigue. Senator, what is your reaction to what the senator has said? I'm fully satisfied. McGovern's reaction was to open his mouth and say the words he would live to eat before he would live them down. I said once that I was behind him a thousand percent, just one time, and I meant it. That's exactly the state of mind I was in. July 27th, McGovern supporters want Eagleton out. McGovern says no. Thomas Eagleton, meanwhile, has flown to Hawaii. It was his first campaign trip, and as it happened, his last. When he returned from the trip, he was, on July 31st, retired from the race by George McGovern. Senator McGovern was really uh, quite uh, torn by that. I think he was at his best as a uh, human being and probably at his worst as a politician, which is not bad. The McGovern-Eagleton ticket. It was history. Next came the McGovern-Shriver ticket. Sergeant Shriver and George McGovern. And off and running, 1,000%. One old-time politician at that youth-dominated Democratic convention said, there's too much long hair here and not enough cigars. Well, he probably didn't read Ms. Magazine or watch M.A.S.H. either, but a lot of people did. Come back to Gloria Steinem and Hot Lips Houlihan in the rest of the summer of 72. Our world continues between the lines in the summer of 72. In one minute, Americans eat 908 pounds of Mexican food. And in about one minute, you can microwave Mexican flavors of Cheese Whiz to make all that Mexican food taste better. Cheese Whiz Processed Cheese Spread, the marvelous microwave-in-a-minute Mexican cheese sauce. Coors Light Hot Dogs, someone got a match. Sunglasses, radio, dive to make the catch. There's no place like this, I cannot tell a lie. Talking about America, the 4th of July. Come on and light up the 4th of course. Hey, there's no slowing down this fourth, so keep it moving with the Silver Bullet Coors Light and Royal Oak Charcoal. Stock up now at any Coors, Coors Light, and Royal Oak display. Light up your fourth of July. It's no secret hairspray holes, but did you know Germac hairspray can also protect? Salon secrets from Germac. Styling. Germac's experts have got what it takes. Professional styling mousse, gel, and hairspray.
They're really special because they actually protect and condition your hair while they shape, style, and hold beautifully. So try Germax Salon Secrets for styling. You know what I do when it comes to styling? With Germac, anything I want. Would you like to have something sweet? What you got there? Nothing. It'll be my cheek. My mom doesn't let us have stuff like that. My mom does. Something you and your kids can agree on. Something with NutraSweet instead of sugar. Would you like to have something sweet? So do you think you could have your mom talk to my mom? Come on, could you skimp on a smile like that? That's why I buy Kraft Singles. Unlike imitations, Kraft is made from five ounces of milk per slice. Plus, her teeth get calcium they need. Skimp on that smile, not with Kraft Singles. Our world will be right back. The silent horror of mental illness. You're out of control and need someone to turn to. Instead, you're thrown onto the streets, or even worse, into jail. That's how America treats its mentally ill, and it could happen to you. An explicit report. They have souls, too. Friday. Cruise on Carnival, the most popular cruise line in the world. 